Mary Melber, uh, I see you thinking over there. Um, uh, your biggest takeaway is from what we know so far. That Jack Smith hasn't said a word. Yeah. And he has the whole country listening. Mm -hmm. uh, that he moved quietly, as Ken just mentioned. Uh, we followed this very closely and didn't even know till recently that he basically opened up the second grand jury for all of the reasons. Not forum shopping, not looking for the easiest place, just following what they believe the facts and the law show. Uh, number two, as your archival clips showed, you know, OJ had the book, If I Did It. Right. Trump's book would be, I Did It. No. Um, we've talked about, you and Joe have talked about how he is the worst possible client. He has all but confessed to aspects of this and doubled down on why he claims, um, most experts think wrongly, um, that he could continue to act this way and hide it from the DOJ. He is legally presumed innocent. We will cover this trial if it gets to trial, like all trials with that legal principle. Um, but he starts out in a hole, Mika, that's worse than most defendants. Yeah, definitely. Joyce Vance, uh, same question to you. Uh, your thoughts on what we know so far. And do you think perhaps the DOJ would benefit from being a little bit more transparent, maybe unsealing it. Well, I always think DOJ would benefit from a little bit more transparency. You can't talk about the substance of cases. DOJ can talk about procedure and what people should expect and charges that have been filed. And I think that we will hear from this attorney general. I think this indictment will be unsealed and we will begin to get a public education on the process here, or at least I hope that's what's in the works. <laughs> But Mika, I've got two real takeaways in this moment, and, and one came together for me watching your opening montage. You know, prosecutors will be able to take clips of Trump talking mm -hmm. about this situation and play them for the jury. And the criminality is just blatant. At every step, at every time that there was a fork in the road, Trump took the wrong path, the path towards criminality. He took documents. He didn't turn them back. He lied about it. He refused to comply with the subpoena. He essentially taunted the government, the Justice Department, into indicting him. And now he's got what he was asking for all along. This is not a close case on the facts. But the other thing that hits me as a prosecutor, and I have to say, um, you'll forgive me, but my prosecutor's heart cringes a little bit at this talk about picking a jury based on where prosecutors think they can get a conviction. What were the voting rates? As a prosecutor, you charge your case where the criminal conduct occurred. Mm -hmm. Venue is a constitutional requirement. I think prosecutors here did the right thing. But the fact that we are here at all is remarkable. Just a year ago, on, on June 9th last year, we were preparing for the first of the eight packaged January 6th committee hearings. And the mood in the country was so different. I remember no one thought that those committee hearings were likely to be a success. There was even less confidence that Merrick Garland and the Justice Department could hold Trump accountable. The progress that we have made in just one year is remarkable. We're not all the way there yet. There's a trial to come. There will be difficult issues. We should have confidence in American resiliency and the rule of law. Yeah, you know, Joyce, uh, it just so happens for venue purposes, uh, they're going to bring this in Miami. I'm sure Jack Smith didn't go. What's going to be, uh, what's going to going to lend the most uh, credibility to a possible conviction down the road? But I'm just saying, I, I, just from from, I guess, just the political side of it, uh, him being. Uh, found guilty in in Miami, Florida, or in mm -hmm. an area where he wins, I think carries even a stronger message than in D.C. or whatever. It'd be like, you know, if a West Texas prosecutor decided to go after Joe Biden. Uh, it just, again, I think it le lends more credibility to, I think, the ultimate conviction if the facts are the way they seem to be laid out right now. I think that's absolutely spot on. Donald Trump is entitled to a jury of his peers, and he is about to get one. Um, in GOJ, we like to say um, that we are the largest law firm in the country, and it's really true. Here, DOJ has the ability to bring subject matter experts from NSD and the special counsel's office. These are the folks who will understand the Espionage Act and how to use a statute called SEPA that helps the government protect those secrets at trial. But they will be able to draw on the expertise of the Miami U.S. Attorney's Office. It's a very skillful office. Those prosecutors know their judges. 
They know their juries. They get convictions in cases all the time. You know, DOJ is in the habit of doing public corruption cases. Jurors listen to the facts. The facts here are strong. Yeah, very strong and Claire McCaskill. Um, Donald Trump knows they're strong. Mm -hmm. Reporting with Jonathan O'Meara and everybody I know that's reporting, uh, people around Donald Trump know this is a very strong case, know he's in trouble. Uh, Jonathan, myself, other people have been hearing that for weeks now. Um, if you're Donald Trump's attorney, and I know it's uh, something you would never be, <laughs> but if you're Donald Trump's attorney knowing what he faces, knowing the number of years in jail he could possibly face, uh, would you not be going to your client and say, let's try to get a deal? Let's, let's, we can shout and yell and stomp our feet, but behind the scenes, let's try to plea this out because if you go to trial, you're going to lose. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, I don't think this is the kind of man that he, he, didn't he say he never had to ask God for forgiveness? Yep. You know, mm -hmm. um, so this is not a guy who has a, a, the ability to claim wrongdoing. It, it, it's just not in his makeup. He, I just don't think he would ever do it. And so the issue is, and Ari can speak to this as well as I can, the issue is going to be jury nullification. What Trump is going for is a concept in the law where the jury ignores the facts in the law and decides based on their own biases. And, you know, you'd see it back in the day when I was in the courtroom prosecuting cases, we'd see it with DWI cases. Jurors would say, but there by the grace of God go I, I'm not going to put this guy in jail for driving drunk because maybe somebody could have put me in jail for driving drunk and I'm just not going to find him guilty. That's called jury nullification. So Trump is going for that. His lawyers know he's going for that. So it will come down to what we call voir dire. And that is the technical legal term for picking a jury. And when you have to have a unanimous jury, then that process in this case will be maybe the most mm. important jury selection in the history of the criminal justice system in America. And speak to that, Ari, and how, how they can actually fare it out somebody who would want to insert themselves on the jury in order to hang the jury, refuse to find this man guilty, even if the facts dictate they should. It's a great point, Claire, uh, our senator and former mm -hmm. prosecutor. I mean, voir dire is where you say, wait, can you really even be impartial? Um, people have seen in the movies or in South Park, the joke is that people would pretend to have biases to get off the jury. In a serious process, you're checking all those biases. I mean, one of the first questions you could ask uh, this kind of jury once, once they're doing it is, who won the 2020 election? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other factual questions, just to start ferreting out, are you involved in the facts or have you imbibed a political movement right now where, <clears throat> where lying, habitual lying, is considered a litmus test or a stunt? Um, the second part of your point I think is important. You know, Donald Trump has been around the legal process forever. Uh, he's been in over 4,000 civil cases. He's now twice impeached, twice indicted, first uh, president ever indicted at this state or federal level, and today the federal case is obviously much larger. It's what could put him in a jumpsuit in a prison. Right. Um, so he has gathered some of these understandings of how to get out of things without knowing all the technical terms. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. He may know at the end of the day, yeah, you could find one for a mistrial. That's one holdout. You could find people who basically say, we're putting the facts to the side, and I like this person, or I see it as a... Uh, the powers of the presidency, even though, of course, he didn't just abuse his power. He's accused of abusing power he didn't have because he's right. just a citizen and he's on tape admitting it. So I think you raise important points that that will come up. We've never had a trial like this. So it's the trial of the decade or century if it's not dismissed. And that jury um, will have to be carefully selected for what I still think many, many Americans are capable of. And that includes people who might dislike Donald Trump as well. Right. We've talked about this side. Right. People who say, oh, you really wish he never won. You thought it was unfair the way he came in in 16. I think we're familiar with those conversations. That also is not appropriate to bring in in any way. You need to find uh, 12 people and alternates who can just look at the facts, not the politics. And in this case, the facts that we know are quite damning.